you, you know who I am now, Nick's uh, uh, give, given the introduction. So I'm, uh, uh, I think Nick said that I'm, I'm the Carnival Program Manager for the Vincent Wildlife Trust. And you, you've heard uh, what I'm going to talk about. So uh, the pine martin is a species that at the Trust we, we have a long association with. Um, you know, we've been doing some work with pine martins for the last 30 years or so. Uh, I actually, before I joined the Trust, my as an undergraduate student, my very first um, research project uh, was radio tracking pine martins up in Galloway, Scotland. So I have a particular uh, fondness for them. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, quite fortunate to several years later to be uh, to be working on them. I just thought I'd say a little bit about who we are for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, this is this is a picture of our founder. This is. Well, the late uh, Honourable Vincent Weir. Uh, so Vincent set up uh, Vincent Wildlife Trust uh, back in 1975. So we've been going for quite a while. Uh, he was a very shy man and the, the trust had quite a, a low profile in the early days, but uh, more recently, particularly with the, the pine mine project, it sort of brought us more into the headlines a bit. So we're, we're a little bit more uh, known these days. Uh, but yeah, we've been plugging away, um, working on mammal conservation, uh, for a number of years. Uh, we're very much a specialist um, conservation, we're an independent conservation charity. Um, we're very much focused on uh, research-led conservation. Uh, we support a number of PhD students, but the, the kind of practical work we do has a very strong um, evidence um, focus. Uh, and we're very niche. Um, we work we, we could potentially work on a range of mammal species, but we have two programs. We have the bat program. Uh, we work on uh, the, uh, particularly the rarer woodland bats. And we own and manage uh, quite a lot of bat reserves, bat roosts. Um, so almost 40 horseshoe bat roosts in, in Britain and Ireland. Uh, but we also have a, a carnivore program. And um, we work on a, a number of species, but I just want to flag up two, um, well, two recovery programs that we're involved in at the moment on our, well, Britain's two most Breton carnivores. Uh, one's the European wildcat. Now that the work there is a very early stage, um, but uh, the, the other work that I'm going to talk about, we, we have a number of projects on, on pine martins, uh, but we're also looking a bit further afield. And uh, I'm currently working with partners in Europe uh, on, I don't know how many people are aware of the European mink. Uh, this is native uh, to Europe. Uh, it was uh, it, it was never never reached Britain, um, but they've gone through a catastrophic decline. And we're working with partners in Europe to uh, to try and restore uh, European mink. But back to pine martins. Um, I'll give a bit of background uh, on pine martins and the history in Britain, and then I'll give uh, a bit of an overview of the the main translocation that we've been involved in in mid Wales, uh, but also I can give an update on the Forest of Dean translocation, other projects we're involved in. And I'll talk a bit of, uh, about the interaction with pine martins and gray squirrels and just finish um, on what the future is looking like uh, for pine martins in Britain. So, sure, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, pine martins, uh, they're a most arboreal uh, mustelid, uh, mustelids being the, the weasel family. Um, so we've got um, six native mustelids uh, in the UK and we've obviously got introduced American mink as well. Uh, pine martins are very much uh, adapted for that arboreal lifestyle. They're, I don't know how many people have been fortunate to, to see a pine martin in, in real life, but they have quite a long bushy tail which aids their balance, but it also helps with insulation in the winter when they're sort of wrapped up in a, in a crevice in a, in a tree somewhere. And uh, one, one of their adaptations actually is they, they can reverse their ankles like squirrels and um, door mice 180 degrees. So it enables them to run down trees just as quickly as they can run up them uh, when, they're, when they're hunting, things like squirrels. Uh, they're mainly nocturnal or crepuscular active um, you know, in the morning, early evening, but they, uh, they, will, um, you know, they will sometimes be active during the day as, as in the case with this one in this photo. Uh, they have a very broad, diet uh, in the autumn, for example, they'll eat a lot of fruit. Um, but during the, the summer, particularly small mammals is, is their main uh, the main item. And anywhere where studies have been done on their diet, field vole, 
where they're present seems to be the, uh, the, the mammal of choice. Uh, and they'll then in any kind of available uh, space in tree cavities, they'll take over squirrel drays, birds nests, uh, and they will occasionally come into um, buildings, um, which uh, can make them a little bit unpopular. Uh, th this is a couple of kits just emerging from a, a, a tree den. Uh, they're strictly solitary, at least for most of the year. Um, the adults, adult pine martins, won't really tolerate other members of the same sex. Um, but uh, of course, males and females need to come together, and, and you know, a, a male's territory may encompass a couple of female territories. Uh, they're very slow breeders. Um, they often don't breed until they're three years old, um, and you know, they normally only have about two or three young. And um, that's one of the reasons actually that they've, it, it's been difficult for them to come back uh, in areas where um, they have uh, been, been uh, pretty much extirpated uh, because they, you know, they do take a while uh, to recover. Uh, one of the things that's of note, I think worth mentioning is uh, like um, a number of other mammal species, but particularly other members of the mustard family, um, they employ delayed implantation, so they breed uh, in the summer, July, August, they mate at that time of year, uh, but the female doesn't become pregnant um, straight away. The, the blastocyst doesn't implant um, until several months later, so she doesn't really technically become pregnant until uh, the following year, and then uh, the young are born in March, April. Uh, we actually exploit that um, um, in connection with translocations, and I'll, I'll mention that, that later. Uh, for uh, they're, they're pretty, you know, they're not big, big mammals. They're about cat size, but they have very large ranges for their size, um, ranging between one to ten kilometers, uh, square kilometers. And this is why they, you know, they generally need quite large forested areas uh, to thrive. Uh, they have been recorded up, you know, this is a single martin range up to 56 square kilometers. That's quite exceptional. Um, but the the lower, the lower the quality of the habitat, the bigger the range needs to be, uh, so there's uh, sufficient food for them. So that's just really a bit about their ecology and their requirements. Uh, history in Britain, I mean, if we go back to the, the Mesolithic um, 7,000 years ago, they were estimated to have been our second most common carnivore in Britain. Uh, we're around about, this is an estimate, obviously, 150,000 pine martins, um, the, the most common, um, kind of all being the, the weasel. Uh, by 1915, um, they declined quite dramatically, um, estimated 98% reduction. The areas in yellow here shows where populations were uh, seen to be hanging on at, at that time, but the stronghold was very much in uh, Northwest Scotland. Uh, this was a combination of factors, um, you'll all be very, aware of uh, the, uh, the, the rate of woodland clearance, um, which um, was you know, a big factor in their decline, uh, but also hunting and uh, predator control uh, just really exacerbated that. So by 2010, other than uh, a few individual, a few odd sightings that's shown by the, the red triangles in this slide, they were really only um, surviving in Scotland, and there hadn't really been any evidence of natural recovery, uh, recovery in England or Wales. So that was really, the, that was the, the, the backdrop for us launching the Pine Martin Recovery Project in 2014. So this involved um, feasibility assessment. Um, so essentially determining, that, that this looked at habitats across uh, Britain uh, to determine if there was suitable habitat in England or Wales where we could consider um, a reintroduction, so using a, a variety of methods. And as a result of that, we identified Mid Wales as uh, being highly suitable uh, as a release area, the area shown in red here. And the map here is the, the areas in black are the most suitable areas for pine martins. And as, as, it, as it gets lighter, it's less suitable. Um, although it's a fairly conservative model, so this was really focused on identifying the best areas for, for releasing martins. So there might be some very grey areas or even potentially white areas within grey areas that are still suitable for pine martins, but they wouldn't be 
prioritized as a, as a reintroduction site. And uh, the reason Mid Wales was chosen, you know, not dissimilar to um, where Mar Martins are doing well in the Highlands of Scotland, there's some large areas of forested landscape and fewer people and roads, so fewer um, potential conflicts. So assessing the suitability of the habitat and the ecological requirements is one thing, but the, the real important factor of the project was the social feasibility. Uh, this is true for any, any reintroduction uh, project really, but particularly uh, one involving carnivores. Uh, it was really important to get the local communities um, on board and um, other landowners and, and stakeholders. Uh, so the slide here just focuses on the work we've been doing with local communities. And uh, we started this at a very local level. So, you know, arranging meetings, obviously pre-COVID um, in village halls. And we, you know, we decided that the best approach was to speak to the, the people in these local areas first, where we uh, were proposing that uh, a reintroduction could take place. And this is an approach that we've practiced all the way through the project. So we've kept local communities informed. Uh, we've also been able to recruit lots of volunteers both locally, but also from you know, uh, universities in the area. So some traveling further afield and uh, they've been helping a lot with the, the kind of monitoring work that we do. But we've also been working with local businesses, putting up um, interpretation panels like the one shown here. Uh, in the middle picture, actually, this was a disused um, Weybridge building at a steam railway um, station in, in Mid Wales. And uh, with the railway who funded a lot of this work, we uh, basically turn this into a pine martin interpretation center where people could go and learn about pine martins and um and also uh, leave uh, any um records of sightings uh, in the area and as i said you know we engage with uh, the full range of, of landowners and stakeholders this i think has been really critical to the success of the project to date um, obviously foresters other conservation groups uh, but also farmers and um, gamekeepers, people with shooting interests where there could potentially be some conflict or at least perceived conflict with pine martins. Uh, the picture on the right, uh, the bottom right, is um, this is some work that we were doing with a gun club in Ireland uh, where pine martins have been uh, naturally recovering fairly well. And, you know, we've been working with them to develop uh, anti, um, well, predator-proof fencing for pheasant pens, uh, not just for martins, but this would keep out a whole range of, of predators. And, you know, the, I guess the, the most important part of this was really, you know, we, we did this work through a variety of methods, through face-to-face -face meetings with individuals, uh, representatives in the area hosting meetings. Um, we also produce leaflets um, that um, give advice on, um, managing forests um, where, where pine martins might be present, but also excluding them from pheasant pens, that kind of thing. Um, and, and the most important thing really has been listening to the concerns of, of people and, and taking them on board and being responsive to uh, any incidents. But actually, you know, so so far in, in Wales, we haven't actually had any incidents, any that have been um, reported where chickens have, have been missing, we've gone and put cameras up and it's always been a fox or, or a polecat. So yeah, so after all of the uh, all of the engagement had been done and we built the, the, the trust and the um, support of stakeholders, landowners, local communities, uh, that brought us the, the exciting bit of actually uh, bringing the martins into Wales. These were all world court um, martins uh, from Scotland, from different capture sites in Scotland. Uh, so we brought 51 martins down in total between 2015 and 2017. Uh, all of these were examined and um, we took blood samples uh, to check for diseases because we didn't want to be introducing any sort of disease in the area. Uh, they're all fitted with pit tags. Uh, this enables us to, even if an animal um, has been killed and scavenged and there's not much left of it, we could uh, identify that from the pit tag. Um, but we also radio collared all of the animals um, for, and, uh, and tracked their progress over the first year uh, of releases. And all of the animals captured were driven down um, on the 
on the day of capture, but we, we did this overnight when it was quieter and um, cooler, uh, so uh, more comfortable for the Martins, because we had to travel quite some distance uh, to get to the release area. Uh, the picture there, that's a Martin in one of the, um, uh, the, the, the crates uh, that we used in like uh, pet, pet kennels. And then uh, when we brought the Martins uh, to the release area, we, we used soft release. So we had um, special pens built. These were built by Chester Zoo. They've got a lot of experience in this area. And the animals uh, are kept there for seven, well, up to seven days to get acclimatized uh, to the area. And it also enables us, it gives us time to get the results back from the blood test, but it also enables us, we can provide food for them during that time and observe them and check that they're behaving norm normally before we release them. And then it's sim simply a case of just opening the door and the Martins are uh, left to go and explore their, their new surroundings. Uh, I thought I'd just include, this was a video that I took on one of the runs that I did. Um, oh, just try that again. So this is one of the Martins. Um, so it's quite remarkable, really. This was um, this Martin had only just been wild caught, maybe had very little, if any, interactions with humans uh, before that. Uh, you can see the radio collars fitted. And uh, for health and safety reasons, we, we had two drivers and we had to change every top drivers every three hours and we'd check on the animals. Um, so we'd uh, probably look quite suspicious. We'd pull into an you know, overnight petrol station and get into the back of the van and check on the Martins and um, feed them some blueberries. That's what was going on there. And you know, the animals remarkably would quite readily, they're obviously hungry. Um, you know, they were provided with water and extra blueberries, but we also fed them by hand, um, or at least using forceps, because that enabled us to just, you know, be able to just check that they were, they were looking in good condition. Uh, all of the animals were, I'd say they were radio tracked for the first year of the study. Um, and so we could monitor their movements and make sure that they established home ranges. And for the most part, they did. Um, this, don't worry about the detail of this, but this was a um, paper that one of our PhD students uh, published last year. Um, the, 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 the blue blotches, well, the red blotches are the home ranges of the animals in 2015. And the blue ones are the animals that were brought down in 2016. And, uh, you know, for the most part, they've all established ranges within the areas, although some uh, have moved quite large distances. One of them moved uh, uh, about 100 kilometers and established a territory in the, uh, in the north of Wales. Uh, survival has been very good, um, well within the limits that you would expect, between 70% and 95%. We did have some animals get predated by um, uh, foxes in the first year, uh, and then a, a couple more were killed on the road in the in, in the second or third year, uh, but the uh, the survival has been very good. And we've also had good evidence of breeding as well. So we've been able to confirm uh, evidence of breeding every year since 2016. Uh, we know for a fact that 10 of the 23 females that were moved uh, have bred. Uh, we suspect 12 of them had, because some of that was more anecdotal evidence from camera traps after the collars had been removed. Uh, and we know that at least 36 kits have been born. And the, uh, hopefully everyone can see these videos okay. Um, this is a video of, this was, um, on the right there is the female. Um, this is one of the animals, um, I think, that was brought down in uh, 2016 and then bred in 2017. And uh, she's got her hands full there with a few uh, youngsters. Um, and this would be one of their early explorations outside of the den box. So we put these den boxes up, they're especially made for pine martins, and we put these up in the release area uh, to provide more denning opportunities for the martins. But when they do use them, it's also a, a quite a good way for us to, to monitor uh, the population. It's not always easy to find uh, their natural uh, den sites. Uh, the population is slowly expanding. Uh, this shows the release sites um, where the animals were released between 2015 and 2017. So the, the green squares here are the 10 kilometer squares um, where the release sites were. 
And we carried out a survey with the help of volunteers in 2019. So this was uh, hunt, searching for scats, uh, but also uh, we had a camera trap loan scheme where volunteers could borrow cameras and um, put them up uh, in the forest in their local area to look for evidence of pine martins. So, so you can see there, there's been quite good, good spread. Um, the animals are moving through the, the Cambrian mountains um, across Wales. And they're probably sp spread further afield again, but uh, it's been very difficult to uh, monitor the movements in um, 2020 because of COVID. And the, so, you know, the, the early indications are that the, the, the project is uh, looking very successful. And in the last couple of years of the project, we've, uh, there's been a big focus away from the very intensive kind of radio tracking of the animals. And that's been switched more to um, really developing community ownership uh, in the areas uh, throughout Wales where the Martins are establishing. So we've been training volunteers, we've been doing lots of talks, um, and you know, there's lots of information on our website. Uh, but in, in the local areas, um, the, a lot of uh, the volunteers have been maintaining camera traps. And also we plan to do periodic every five years or so surveys of the area to see how the Martins are doing. So that's that's been the shift. I probably should explain this photo, actually. I don't know how well you can see this, but this object here, this is uh, what we call this a jiggler. Uh, it's actually two tea strainers that have been strapped together that contain um, uh, a tasty morsel for pine martins and peanut butter or even just some lure to attract them. And the idea is to get the martin to stand up uh, in view of uh, this is a we've got a trail camera uh, fixed on the jiggler. Um, which um, is activated by motion. And what we're trying to do here is get a picture of the pine martin's bib because each pine martin's bib is unique to that individual. So it's a bit like tiger stripes. Um, you know, uh, you can identify individual tigers uh, from the pattern of their stripes. So we use the same technique here. And, you know, we've got um, illustrations of the bibs of all of their translocated animals and also some animals that have turned up. Uh, on camera traps so and this has been quite a useful thing uh, to to get volunteers in, involved in to uh, you know if they get um, images of pine martins to try and match them to the bibs uh, and of course everyone's friend here the gray squirrel this is one of the outtakes from the uh, uh, from the the camera trapping uh, this is a male gray squirrel showing off uh, some jigglers of its own um, but we've had some quite entertaining um, non-target interest in in the jigglers um, uh, but I, yeah, I haven't got time to show them all, all here. Uh, I just thought I'd briefly mention a couple of other pine mine projects that, that we're involved in. Uh, one of these, uh, along with the pine mine recovery project in Wales, just came to an end last year. This is part of a big national initiative that's been run uh, by Natural England, uh, Back from the Brink project, uh, covering a range of species across the country. And our involvement has been, um, well, looking for evidence of recolonizing martins in uh, the north of England, uh, in Northumberland and Cumbria. Uh, the video here actually is, um, as far as we know, the first uh, ever video of a pine martin in, in Northumberland. Um, and the, uh, the project officer working on the project, he was able to get, um, working with local partners and, and volunteers, um, 50 plus records of um, martins mainly in Northumberland, but also some in uh, Cumbria. So, you know, it's early days, but they are colonizing uh, the north of England from Scotland, which is good to see. Uh, and we've been carrying out a similar program of engagement and uh, with landowners and putting up den boxes, training volunteers, doing surveys, that kind of thing. Um, the Forest of Dean translocation, uh, I assume people know about this. Uh, it's uh, led by the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust and uh, Forestry England uh, uh, provide a lot, of, a lot of the funding for that. Uh, we're partners on the project and um, we helped a lot in the, uh, during the feasibility. So we provided a lot of uh, technical advice and we were, um, we were the ones that actually carried out the trapping of the Martins and the translocation in 2019. So 18 animals uh, were translocated. Uh, there's already evidence of breeding there. This is uh, one of the radio collared females with two of the kits. You can hear the kits calling. Um, so far, there's been good survival and I'd say already evidence of breeding. We did plan to 
translocate more animals in 2020. Uh, that didn't happen because of COVID, um, but we are hoping and planning on uh, translocating more animals uh, later this year. Uh, so that brings us to pine martins and gray squirrels. Uh, this was, I should say really that, you know, the, um, the report of pine martins having an impact on gray squirrels is quite well reported now. Um, it wasn't something that drove the translocation in, in Wales. That was very much around um, the conservation of, of pine martins. You know, if we see any benefit uh, of them having a negative impact on grey squirrels, then that will obviously be a bonus. Um, but this was, I think, one of the driving considerations for um, the uh, a translocation being considered in the Forest of Dean and, and certainly you know, the interest by the forestry, by Forestry England on that. Uh, the video here actually, if I can get this to play. Um, so we, that's one of uh, the Welsh translocate, or the, one of the animals that was translocated uh, from Scotland and uh, with a, a predated grey squirrel. So we've, we've got quite a lot of evidence of them taking grey squirrels in, in Wales now. So uh, and there is evidence, I think, in the Forest of Dean already. Uh, so we, we know that there are predating squirrels. Uh, and there's been, um, uh, there's, well, there's been a, a number of studies on that now. Before I um, comment on those, I thought I'd just uh, emphasize this point because uh, I'm not sure everyone will necessarily be aware of that. But obviously the gray squirrels are um, introduced uh, to Britain and uh, they don't have pine martins in North America. They do have a very similar species, the American martin, so that's the sort of closest predator that a gray squirrel would have evolved with. Uh, but if you look at the range of the American martin, shown in red here, uh, there's very little overlap with that of the range of uh, gray squirrels. So that's sort of these, these eastern states here. Uh, so it's just to make the point that pine martins are a novel predator for gray squirrels, which could be uh, why pine martins might have a, a, um, a disproportionate impact on gray squirrels compared to red squirrels, which they, they might also predate, um, but red squirrels have evolved uh, with gray squirrels. So they, you know, they're more, um, they should have the more adaptive traits to escape predation by gray squirrels. Uh, I had prepared a few studies to summarize, but I decided I'd just flag up a couple uh, for the talk now in the interest of time. Uh, but I have got the others uh, at the end if if they're relevant and uh, they come up in the um, in the in the discussion. Uh, but I think it's worth flagging up these studies that I think people will be familiar with. But um, this was quite a key one by Emma Sheehy and uh, others uh, in 2014. And uh, this study was based on a distribution survey of um, both species of squirrel and pine martins in Ireland. So this was using hair tubes but also sightings. And it was very clear from this study that there'd been a real crash in the gray squirrel population uh, in the Irish Midlands. And, and also red squirrels had become much more common uh, in the same area. And what Emma found when she analyzed the data were, were that where gray squirrels were still present, um, they were a, a very low density and there was a real strong positive correlation uh, between pine martins and red squirrels. So where, pine, where there are more pine martins, you know, there tends to be more red squirrels. And this correlation was negative with gray squirrels. So, you know, it seems to be quite compelling here that the, the change in fortunes of red squirrels and gray squirrels in, in the Irish Midlands was being driven somehow by um, the natural recolonization of pine martins in the area. In case anyone's wondering what a pine martin hair tube looks like. Uh, this is one in action. It's essentially a piece of drain pipe that we strap to a tree. Uh, it's got some bait in it, uh, but the martin has to push in quite hard to get to the bait. And in the process leaves a sample of hairs behind. Uh, there's a, um, some, sticky some very sticky, sticky tape on the inside of the, the tube. So that gives us, by checking the tubes, it gives us evidence that a pine martin's visited or it could be another species like a, a squirrel that's left hairs. And you can also get those hairs genotyped 
uh, do DNA analysis, so you can even identify individuals. Um, and, and the other study that I was going to flag up was also uh, by Emma and colleagues, uh, and this was uh, this found a similar effect of pine martins um, in Scotland. So um, the only difference here in, in terms of the methodology was that um, peanut feeders with hair traps attached uh, were used to, to get the evidence of um, visitation by martins or squirrels. And again, there was a negative relationship between gray squirrels and pine martins. Um, don't worry too much about the terms here, but uh, this study went a little bit further and looked at uh, a kind of proxy for pine martin abundance. So uh, what Emma concluded from this, that where pine martins were more abundant, they were having, you know, as you would expect, that there was some kind of density uh, effect and they were having more of a negative impact on gray squirrels. Uh, and the same again, positive impact on red squirrels where uh, there were more pine martins. And the, uh, the graph here just, or the, yeah, the graphs here just show that. The one on the left, these were the areas in Scotland where the studies were carried out. At the top here, there were no gray squirrels. This is just red squirrels and pine martins. Uh, but in areas where there were gray squirrels, uh, in the green here and the blue, um, where there was, um, where there was, where martins were more abundant, then the, uh, the number of squirrels went down. So that's why the graphs go down here. The, sorry, the number of gray squirrels. Um, but this, uh, this effect was much more profound uh, in the areas here where martins had been for longer and were more established and at higher densities. And then the opposite was true uh, for pine martins and red squirrels. So, um, so as I say, I think, I think the evidence from these two studies alone is very compelling. Um, they, they didn't by themselves demonstrate the cause and effect uh, so there were very much correlations, uh, but I think it does suggest that um, it's pretty clear that gray squirrels are di being displaced by some mechanism or other by pine martins, whether uh, they're moving out of the area when pine martins become more, more abundant, or whether just the act, the act of direct predation. And there, there, there are also other hypotheses that have been suggested uh, that have suppressed reading of gray squirrels. Uh, and we don't have a, a clear answer to that yet, although there have been some other studies that have tried to get uh, to a, a conclusion. One of these was by Josh Twinin, that um, I, I just thought I'd summarize that uh, in, in the point here. Uh, basically, um, he showed some evidence that gray squirrels, as we might expect, lacked this evolved anti-predator response to pine martins compared to red squirrels. And he did this by applying um, pine martin scent to feeders that were put out for squirrels. So when the, the scent was applied, red squirrels became much more vigilant and were less likely to visit the feeder, whereas gray squirrels just seemed to avoid the scent. So at least, so they didn't appear to uh, have any recognition of those kind of olfactory clues uh, to a, a predator that they should be concerned about. Uh, but one, one thing that's very clear from the studies that have been done today is that uh, the interactions are not straightforward and they are quite complex and influenced by other factors. Uh, so depending on things like alternative prey, uh, the different types of habitat, uh, but also the population density of martins and squirrels. So, um, you know, although the results today are quite com compelling that, you know, if martins recolonize areas where there are currently gray squirrels, we would expect them to have a negative impact on that, those gray squirrels. We can't assume that we'll see exactly the same impact uh, in parts of England and Wales that we've seen uh, in Scotland and Ireland, but it is something that um, we are keen uh, to observe. Uh, the other thing to point out, of course, because there's, there's been a lot of interest in reintroducing pine martins to parts of their former range, uh, particularly in England, um, but some parts of England are just currently not suitable for pine martins, uh, or not at the moment anyway, either because there just isn't sufficient connected uh, forests, uh, but also exacerbated by, you know, high road density and, um, and you know, uh, high, high urbanisation and large numbers of people. So I, I guess in one sentence to summarise that, 
Um, you know, I think the recovery of pine martins is likely to benefit red squirrel conservation and presumably forestry as well. And I'd say there's some, some good evidence to support that. Um, the long-term impact isn't known. So it may be that pine martins drive gray squirrels down initially, some animals survive and over time, you know, manage to um, evade predation by pine martins that they actually evolve. Um, but, you know, even if pine martins kept them down to a lower density, that would still benefit um, red squirrels and forestry, I think. So it's not a silver bullet, um, particularly in areas that are no longer suitable uh, for pine martins, or at least to hold a high density of pine martins. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's encouraging. So just to, to finish, um, future prospects for pine martins in Britain. The area in yellow here, um, sorry, should go back to that. Uh, so that was the situation in 2010. Uh, it's already looking a lot better. Um, this map, it was produced by a colleague of mine, and it, it maybe gives an over-optimistic impression of how well pine martins are doing. Um, because essentially what's been done here is a 10 kilometer buffer has been shaded in around all known pine martin records, uh, recent pine martin records. So it doesn't mean that those areas are in, you know, the, the pine martins occupy all of that green space, but there could be currently we, pine martins occupying any of those green areas. Um, so we've got, got good evidence of that. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I've said this already, the, um, you know, this just flags up the areas where martins are naturally recon recolonizing in South Scotland. This has mainly come from translocations into Southern Scotland rather than um, uh, an expansion from their stronghold in Northwest Scotland. Uh, but those animals are already uh, establishing uh, across the border. No evidence of breeding yet in North of England, but that will be the, the next thing that we're looking for. Uh, I'd say the, the population in mid Wales is, is doing well, uh, but they are still at low density, so they are still vulnerable. Um, and there's early indication the forest of Dean population uh, is doing well. And there are some small isolated populations, um, although I've got a question mark here around populations. You know, there are individuals uh, regularly, uh, we're regularly getting caught in Shropshire on camera traps, uh, but we don't really know where those animals have come from or how many animals are there. And there are also animals um, that are occasionally, we occasionally get records of them in the new forest. We suspect these are from unofficial releases, but we don't know uh, how many animals are there. Uh, and the last population estimate for Britain uh, was around 3,700 martins. So they're still categorized as critically endangered. So they still uh, need uh, conserving. And on that note, uh, my colleague has been working on a, a long-term strategic recovery plan uh, for martins in Britain. She has actually finished this, uh, but it's with um, uh, Nature Scott and uh, Natural England who provided funding for that. So we're hoping to make that uh, publicly available, um, hopefully by the end of, of this month. And the three, uh, I guess, overarching aims of this is to conserve the recovering population in Scotland uh, and including um, ensuring that there's not any overharvesting of martins for transportation projects in the future. Uh, but also to promote and facilitate this natural recolonization that we're seeing in areas in southern Scotland, in the north of England, and also now from the translocated animals in, in Wales, and also the Forest of Dean. Uh, but also the, the plan will prioritize areas in England and Wales that might be considered for um, future translocation so that this is done in a, um, a strategic way um, because. Um, you know, as I say, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of factors to consider uh, before embarking on a, on a translocation, and we need to make sure the conditions are absolutely right uh, for the Martins before we do that. Uh, but just to end on a positive note, we're hoping we do, uh, we are able to uh, move some more Martins down to the Forest of Dean later this year, and potentially there could be other areas um, uh, that are considered suitable for future translocations. The Southwest uh, the Southwest Peninsula is probably the, the, the most favorable next uh, option that might be considered. So that's, uh, that's the end of the slides. So you know, I hope that was um, interesting uh, for people and yeah, really happy to uh, 
um, answer any questions. I haven't been able to um, check the, the chats uh, while I've been speaking, but I gather somebody else might have been doing that. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you, Steve, uh, for an excellent talk and the update on your work with the Trust, how it's been going. We've got a number of questions in the chat, so I was going to ask Simon um, if he could read those out, um, with, starting with Will, I think it was. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, Steve, for a brilliant uh, talk. Loved your uh, uh, video clips, so really nice. Um, yeah, glad they worked. <laughs> Uh, the, um, you, you've covered the interaction between pine martens and um, grey squirrels uh, very well, but uh, there's a question in the chat about the impact of pine martens on other native species, including uh, owls and woodland birds. And uh, could, could you, Do you have any, any comments like that on that? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point, actually. Um, I was... I was conscious of how much material I could sort of in, in, include in this, but it would have been good to have had maybe one slide on that. Um, but yeah, potentially uh, they, you know, I, I said they have a, a broad diet and they will take birds, particularly um, in the spring when there are sort of eggs and, and chicks available. I guess the, the overarching point is to, um, is to remember that they have co-evolved uh, with all of these species. So, you know, any sort of woodland birds in, in Wales, in the Forest of Dean, in other areas where they might be recovering, so including uh, owls, uh, would have evolved with pine martins. Um, so having some predation is not necessarily gonna be a limiting factor on, on those populations. Um, but what, what we what we did as part of the feasibility study and what we always recommend for any other feasibility studies and it was done for the Forest of Dean as well is that we did um, as part of that feasibility assessment we we did look to see what uh, red and amber listed birds might be breeding in the area and we looked at things like um, whether that area was um, nationally important for any of those species so if there was a disproportionate you know, if there was a disproportionate importance of that area, that kind of thing. Um, in the areas where, where we carried out their introductions, there wasn't any species that were flagged up as needing any kind of mitigation, but there, there are recommendations for um, nest boxes, uh, for example, um, particularly for things like um, flycatchers, that kind of thing. Um, because you know, they could be vulnerable as they are to squirrels as well. Squirrels, also woodpeckers will predate um, um, you know, um, fledglings, that kind of thing. So the main thing from a perspective of, of pine martins is that one, one individual has quite a big territory. Um, and as I said, they're very um, territorial. So they're unlikely to have a significant impact on populations of birds um, nesting within those areas, but it is possible that they, you know, they might predate um, the occasional nest. Um, but there are practical measures that you can take for um, nest boxes. Does that, does that yeah. answer no, that? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, another question here is, uh, how will the genetic viability be maintained with such small numbers being released in Wales? Yeah, okay, really, really good question, actually. Um, one of the, I, again, didn't report on this in, in the talk, but we, for, for the, um, the trapping that we've carried out, we carried that out over a number of different sites. And this was partly to minimize the impact on what we call the donor population. So we didn't want to take too many martins from Scotland from the same site. So we had a maximum of four animals that we took from any, any area, but this also enabled us um, to increase the genetic diversity of the animals that we translocated. And uh, one of the studies that we did, we looked at through um, scats that were collected in the area in Scotland where we took the animals from. Uh, we worked with the Waterford Institute of Technology in Ireland and, and uh, we looked at the level of genetic variability in that area. And we also looked to see whether that went down after we took Martin. So that was uh, one part, part of the sort of recommendations of the project. 
but it also enabled us to look at the genetic variability of, of, at the same time of the animals that we translocated. And what we found actually was the, the genetic variability, although it's a relatively low number of animals, 51 founder animals, um, that there was no significant difference between that and the area across Scotland where we took, took the martins from. So, the, so actually the variability uh, is, is actually quite high. So we're not, um, it's something that uh, we could monitor, but we're not proposing that we need to introduce more animals later on to um, increase that. Um, and th there have been some, um, there were some reports of Martins, or well, we did have some direct evidence of Martins before um, the translocations, very few and far between. Uh, there was a, a roadkill in, in the last sort of 10 years, and there was some scat that was identified as Pine Martin. So we were very confident that there wasn't a viable breeding population in Wales, but there may have been some individuals. We don't know the origin. We suspect that they were probably unofficial releases. And we do know that there are other unofficial releases going on around the country and possibly in, in Wales as well. And there is a completely separate project in the north of Wales that um, by uh, the, the Gwynedd Pine Martin project, which it isn't a, a, a big translocation, but they've been doing some work looking at captive bred pine martins, and um, and I think they may they're talking about very low numbers, but there there were plans there to release some areas um, to boost the martin population in the north of Wales, uh, and really to it's, it's really to prevent reinvasion of grey squirrels onto Anglesey. So it's that area in sort of north, um, northwest Wales. So there are, outside of our project, it looks like, you know, there will be other, uh, there will be more genetic variability being introduced anyway, uh, but it's already um, very high and it's, you know, it will, it, it, you know, it's, it's not a case that they've gone through a, a strict bottleneck and that's going to cause them problems. You know, there's the, the genetic variability is, is as high as it needs to be. Thank, thank you very much. So there's a, another question which relates to um, resistance by um, maybe pheasant shoots uh, and yeah. some farmers to the reintroduction of, um, of pine martins as a direct threat to, to their, uh, their interests. Have you had an experience of working with uh, pheasant shoots, uh, farmers, and, and bringing them on side. Could you? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have. We've, we've done a lot of that. Um, we actually, we, that 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 side of the project, we had a, um, a project officer based in in the community uh, for two years leading up to the um, to the, the to the actual translocation, and so he was very much embedded in the in the local community. Uh, and as I said in the talk. We took the approach that we wanted to do this really at the sort of grassroots level and get out and speak to the the, the local um, landowners, community stakeholders first, uh, and that included the the local shoots. And you know that I, I guess that we 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 partially you know that the area that we selected in that mid Wales one of the um, uh, criteria for that was that there there wasn't. A high number of sort of big commercial shoots that could have been a been a problem. So uh, I guess we'd already put the odds in our favour in that in that respect. Um, but there were some local shoots in the area, uh, and I guess they were kind of indifferent really. They didn't really see pine martins as re representing a, a big threat. We did offer to increase the um, the, the, the the fencing uh, around their pens and and to be able to use them as a kind of exa exemplar, uh, as we've done with the, the shoot in Ireland. Um, but they, they weren't really that interested in taking us up on that offer. Um, and as I say, there haven't been any instances in, in, in the release area in Wales of pine martins uh, predating pheasants. It's, you know, it's a possibility, um, but it's only really during that critical time when the poults are flightless in the pens and you know, again, there are practical measures which you know, we've provided information on that, and we've provided this directly to 
organizations like you know the British Association for Student Conservation, GWCT, and the, the National Gamekeepers Organization. So there are practical measures that can be taken to increase the um, uh, the, the biosecurity essentially. Um, but you know we, we haven't had direct problems in Wales, but the, you know there are reports of this you know being a problem uh, in other places, although um, it is possible to apply for licenses licenses to say Nature Scott in Scotland if there's you're experiencing problems with pine martins. So very few, if any, licenses are ever applied for. So either it's not really happening on any kind of scale, or in places where you know there are problems with pine martins and pheasants, then it's being dealt with quietly and people are not getting to hear about it. But you know that again because you know because an individual animal has such a, a large home range and because they're not really birds bird specialists they will take birds during the spring uh, mammals are their, their sort of preferred prey although there's a risk there you know they're not likely to have a, um, a massive impact um, uh, across the board but there is always that that potential so we need to be ready for that and we we also during the course of the project we did have a mitigation um, scheme where we you know if there was any evidence of pine martins um, uh, taking either chickens or pheasants we would reimburse for the cost uh, of those animals um, but as I say you know we've only been called out on a couple of occasions to look into predation events and it, it's in, in close in both those cases and say it was either a fox or, or a polecat so so far there hasn't been any any direct evidence in the in the release areas, but it's it's really important to you know to, to talk to to the shoots and the and the gamekeepers and to and to get their trust really and get them on board. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sure everyone's got lots uh, lots of other questions. I, I, know, I know I do, but we've only got time for one more uh, question, and, and there's one more here on the chat, uh, which is. Uh, um, what is the typical population density of an established um, pine martin colony uh, compared to gray squirrels? Yeah, well, <laughs> very low. Uh, you know, if, if you think of those, um, you know, those those sort of home range sizes, you know, a, a mouse um, home range could easily be ten square kilometers. Now there may be one or two. Uh, female territories within that but you know you're only then talking about um you know free animals over 10 square kilometers and that's in an area of suitable habitat for the martin so the actual density of the population uh, might be lower over a bigger area so um having said that you know in areas that are um, very suitable for pine martins, then the, the density can be higher. It's, it's very variable, so it's, it's not easy to just put a, a, a single figure on that. But, um, you know, a, a martin's, indivi an in individual territory might be closer to uh, kind of one, one square kilometre. So you can see then that if you've got an area where um, that's very highly suitable for pine martins, you know, you could have enough martins you know in a, in an area to to be having an impact on on gray squirrels but yeah they're not going to be anywhere near the kind of densities that we get of gray squirrels in uh you know in, in you know particularly in some of the the sort of southern broadleafed uh, forests and that that's why i i sort of had that caveat with what people might expect to see particularly from the the reintroduction into the forest of dean you know, we we might not see that that the same. You know, we might not see grey squirrels disappearing from areas, but I, I think they will they will have have an impact because you know grey squirrel just represents a good source of um, prey uh, for for the pine martin. So, thank thank you very much, Nick. Over to you. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> thank you, Steve for your very detailed answers. We've obviously generated a lot of interest with the questions and your work. And uh, tonight has been a great insight to what uh, your work has been delivering and hopefully uh, 
will be helping our sector of forestry um, within uh, sort of the next gen uh, 10, 20 years perhaps, you know, but uh, we'll just have to wait to see. But uh, no, it'd be interesting to have you back in a few years time to uh, see how the spread has gone. But uh, I'm going to close tonight's meeting by thanking everybody who's joined us um, for all your questions, for holding the AGM, etc., in this virtual world. And uh, if we could show visibly Steve's, uh, our thanks to Steve by just holding our hands and clapping, you know, it would be just nice to uh, say thank you again, Steve. And I will close this AGM and uh, talk and uh, wish everybody to keep well and safe. And uh, we'll see you out in the woods again, hopefully this summer. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully. And we'll close the meeting. Good night. Thank you.